So anyway, uh, hopefully you guys saw, uh, you know, there's a quiz that popped up there. Uh, you guys are welcome to use your books and all that other kind of stuff, right? The questions are involving in just you describing certain properties and things that we talked about in class. So just as a quick this and that, when I ask you guys to describe something or discuss something, um, I need you guys to, so just like on any exam, right? Any exam, your guys' job is to convince the professor that you know what you're talking about, right? If you've been reading up on it, you've been processing the information, you've been uh, taking that information and converting it into your own language, right? Into your own set of ideas and thoughts there, right? I don't need you guys to write a treatise for me, right? I don't need a three-page article about why one solvent has a higher boiling point than the other, right? But when I ask you guys a question about describe why we see this difference in the boiling point, in the context of chapters 11 and 12, they're all we've been talking about are the intermolecular forces, got it? And so when I ask you guys to describe the difference in the boiling point of a, of a solvent, right? So what I'm saying is, hey, look at the three intermolecular forces and say how each of those could affect the difference in the boiling point there. Do you guys get what I'm saying with this? I don't need an exhaustive summary and you know, you guys doing all this stuff, but you know, just show me that you guys have been reading through and you understand what you're talking about. Does that make sense, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not looking to, this, I, I don't know, sometimes there's this disconnect here. I'm not looking to take points away from you guys, but I'm looking for you guys to show me that you earned the points too, if that makes sense, right? Yep. So just you know, go through there, think about it a little bit. It's not a timed quiz or anything, so you guys are welcome to you know, look it up and, and then see what you guys can come up with there, okay? All right, so that's due, I think, tonight at like midnight or something like that is what it is, or like 11.59, so spend a little bit of time on that. Make sure you set aside some time to get it done also, and then um, we, can move, uh, we can move forward. And we'll probably have like a quiz each week or something like that. We'll, have a, one, we'll finish up this chapter today, and then uh, the next quiz will be on um, uh, this stuff. Right? So, yeah, what's up? Kind of weird question, if not. I wouldn't have expected weird. anything else. <laughs> not, not especially related to anything. But yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> still, I'm still with you, but go ahead. Um, so, have you ever heard of a Dremel being used to do a centrifuge? Yeah, actually. So. Um, because I acquired Dremel yesterday. Yeah, so the, uh, one of the, this is completely random, and I'll, maybe this will tie into your quick answer there, but so there's an entire book that was written about 3D printing your own laboratory, and you can actually make a micro centrifuge by 3D printing like an adapter you can put on the front. So it's out there, the planes are for free, you can go look it up and all this kind of stuff. But it's definitely, it's definitely I know a guy who knows a guy who has a dream. Ah, there you go. I know a guy who knows a guy. All right, so <laughs> you got the hook up. I see. <laughs> anyway, cool. So uh, here we are. Uh, we're we're going to be we're a little bit behind with our lecture, so I apologize for that. I know that might have caused some headaches for you guys in the lab, but that means you guys already know what we're going to talk about today. And so you know, what can we say, right? You guys learn it one place first, and then. Uh, learn it again in another place. It's always easier the second time you look at something or you read through something there. Okay, that's all right. We'll catch back up in last year. I hope. Um, so um, last time we had gone through and uh, oh crud, what did we do last <laughs> night? I forgot. <laughs> oh right, right, right. Yeah. So we learned about some of the different concentrations, right? The parts per million, parts per billion. We learned about mass percent and all these kind of things, right? There's different ways of um, different ways that we have of measuring concentrations, right? And the big thing that we learned about was the idea of molality, right? Wherein we now can represent a concentration based off of mass, right? Moles of the solute and kilograms of the solvent, right? One of the things that we said about this, or why it's important, is that these are independent of temperature, right? which is something that affects the, the uh, molarity, right, and the concentration from there, right? So this is, uh, these are used in specific cases where temperature is something we have to pay attention to, is kind of what it is, right? And I believe in lab this week, you guys went through and you were measuring what's a freezing point depression of, of different solvents and stuff like that. So what do you, what do you, what are you guys looking at? Cyclohexane, is that the solvent you guys yeah. are doing? Yeah, yeah that's, a very, that's a very common one. And, and then you guys all walked out smelling like mothballs, right? Because you guys had naphthalene as one of the. Is that what you guys were doing? No, too, we were or? using one for dichloroethane, uh, I think. Oh, okay, okay. And okay. then an unknown, which we were told was toxic. 
Oh, okay, that'll so. probably have bowling them. It wasn't white and kind of flaky. And, no. Oh, never mind. Oh, what the heck do I know? It looked right. kind of like salt, <laughs> but it wasn't. Okay, cool. Like clearer, less white, like sort of white, but not super white, because that's a really great description. Yeah, I got it now. <laughs> I'm picturing it in my mind. Like an eggshell, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, anyway, so we're going to be kind of looking a little bit at the math today, and then uh, once we wrap this up, i got a couple of problems at the end. And then uh, uh, we'll call it a day there, right? So, all right, so let's talk about some of these things here. Um, vapor pressure lowering. We talked a little about vapor pressure and just uh, kind of how that relates back to the boiling point and, and what the technical definition for a boiling point is, right? But there is a Rowlett's Law here, which is, I don't know, it's kind of, you know, a simple, uh, a simple expression here, right? So the vapor pressure of a solvent over the solution is equal to the mole fraction times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent there. So we just have a way of kind of examining the vapor pressure as we start to dissolve things into a solution is what it comes down to, right? So again, when we're dealing with these properties, we're talking about these colligative properties, we're talking about when we have a solution and how what we dissolve affects that solution, right? That's all it comes down to. All right, so just like what you guys looked at in lab, there was the boiling point and the freezing point, and how that changed the, it changed the properties of that pure solvent, right? So you guys had the freezing point for cyclohexane, and then you add some stuff to it, then it dropped it, right? So the same thing that's going on here, we add something to a solution, and it changes the vapor pressure also. Now, it's an interesting question, right? Because you guys might be sitting there and saying, Dr. H, you have no idea how much I wanted to learn about vapor pressure. This is exactly what I wanted to know about, right? Because every day I wake up and I question about why, you know, vapor pressure is a thing, you know, but you guys get the point I'm saying, you know, right? But the question is this, how does this relate to everything else we've been talking about so far, right? That's the question to start to consider here. Like, why is this particular idea or concept or thought put into this chapter? And can you guys convince yourself, right? that adding something to solution can change the vapor pressure, whether it increases it or decreases it, right? That might be a thought to think about there. Yeah, what's up? Okay, so vapor pressure is affected by temperature, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so does that have anything to do with why, like, this morning the canal, you could, like, really see kind of, I guess, essentially water vapor hovering over the water? I mean, yeah, it's a temperature difference, right? From, you know, water takes a long time to cool down and heat up, right? So right. air temperature is a lot easier to fluctuate temperature or, or change temperature there, right? So. Right, but so d does that mean that like one of the reasons why the vapor sits so like to such a greater extent to where it's that visible is, does it have something to do with the temperature affecting the vapor mm -hmm. pressure? Sure, cool. Yep. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, so it's right here, right? So the moles of whatever it is that you're examining, right, over the total moles of whatever's in there. So it's just a fraction of the moles, that's all it is. Yeah, we'll do an example here in just a second. And yeah, but like I said, it's just a, um, if we actually talked about the same idea back in the gas law chapter when we talked about partial pressures, right, where we just said, you know, the pressure is just the sum of the fractions of things that are in there, right? So same idea here. All right. So I think it's the next slide here, actually. So you guys got that equation, right? That's what you guys will need there. The vapor pressure of the solvent over the solution, the mole fraction, and then the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Right? So three parts to the equation. So I need to give you guys. We're calculating the vapor pressure of urine? No. Urea. That's urea. Isn't urea like the main compound in urine? I would say water is, but. Well, you know what I mean. Like, what side no, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Anyway, so here it is, right? So a solution of something, <laughs> solution of urea and water is a vapor pressure and it gives you that value. The vapor pressure of pure water it gives you that value and it says to calculate the mole fraction, right? So what do we have here? We have an equation of three parts and what do I give you information about? Two of those, got it? So let's see what you guys come up with.
and think about what you're calculating. What are you solving that fraction for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is this value right there represent? So that's your mole fraction of what? Right, so think about that. That's the, well, that's the tricky part about this question. I know, I feel it. Think about this here, right? So we're looking at this equation, and we add something that um, that seems relatively straightforward, right? Because we look. Oh, yeah, let's pick a different color. I don't feel yellow this morning. Right? Would match the here, yeah. Um, right. And then that's kind of what our equation was, right? The pressure of our solution, right, is equal to the mole fraction times the pressure of the pure solvent, right? You guys with me on this? Mm -hmm. You guys catch that? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Yes. So what should we really be seeing here, right? The pressure of the water, right? The mole fraction of the water, the partial, pr or the pressure of the water. So what is the mole fraction that you're solving for? The mole fraction of? Water. water. But what did I ask you? The mole fraction of? You guys with me on this? Mm -hmm. So we have to think about what this question is asking real quick, right? So let's plug in some numbers. Um, right, so the uh, P of H2O, P91.24, right? So the pure solvent, 355.14. If you guys allow me a liberty here, I, I fully trust you guys can solve this equation without me showing it to you. <laughs> but if, if you're, but don't, don't, well, okay, now, now I said something you guys aren't better, but yes. <laughs> great, I got a point to make. All right, yeah? Why do we assign P as H2O when we need, um, how yeah. to So what is, what information do we have here? The solution of urea in water has a vapor pressure, right? So the partial pressure of that solution, right? Right, the vapor pressure of pure water is 355.1, right? So we're gonna get the mole fraction of the water based off the data that we have, right? But what do we mean by a mole fraction? What do all fractions have to add up to be? What do, what do we make of this solution here? Everything has to add up to be equal to what? 100. 100, right? Or, to put it more simply, it has to be equal to what? One. Right? Everything has to add up to be equal to that one. 
So 0.82 of this, or 82% of this, is water. So what's the other 18%? Urea. Urea. You guys got it? So that's the kind of part that we have to pay attention to there. What is this question asking us? What's dissolved and how much of that's dissolved and the solvent and the pressure and all these kind of things in there? Okay? That's the other way of looking at this. How would this be different if we had urea and something else and water together? It wouldn't, right? Everything would still add up to be equal to one, but what would I do? I'd have to give you guys more information about what's present in there. You guys got it? Mm -hmm. So the math on this isn't all that challenging, right? The idea is what does it mean to you and what are you calculating for, right? Yeah? Would there be a situation where we would be asked to calculate the um, mole fraction of water without being given? No, I'd, I'd have to give you some other information, right? Because like, there's. You, like, which, meaning, like, instead of water, is there a possible way that we could calculate urea's mole fraction without being given the vapor pressure of water? Meaning, can this equation be used on the salt? Uh, yeah, but I'd have to give you information about the pressure then for whatever to be the result. Right? We, we do it the same way, but from the opposite end, yeah. right? At, at the end of the day, maybe to answer your question, but if, if it's not what, what you were asking, then just correct me. But at the end of the day, I have to give you information about two of these things. It doesn't matter what, yeah. right? I was just wondering if it's for, like, because I know I said that this equation is for solvent. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, fair enough, right? So it's for whatever component in there, if you want to think about it like that, okay. right? Yeah? I keep seeing this non-volatile, uh, we talk about solvent, it's like non-volatile. Uh-huh, yeah. I Googled it and it said, basically, it's not crazy, it'll, it'll kind of mellow. Yep, what is, is, that what the, is that what Google said? It's, it's going to mellow exactly out? What <laughs> What's, what's your uh, question? What does it mean to be non-volatile? Can you supplement my, my definition of non-volatile? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. So let's say that we are in the lab or in a controlled environment, right? And we, um, you know, put a beaker of water out there, right? And we check back in a week. What's going to happen to that water? Maybe less of it. Yeah, some of it's going to evaporate, right? Now, it's not that we're sitting there and we're putting it 100 degrees Celsius. It's just over time, right? And we'll learn about why exactly a little bit later, right? We'll talk about these other uh, aspects of uh, something being spontaneous, right? But over time, this is going to evaporate. There's a certain volatility associated with water, okay? So now imagine you have a beaker and you put something like gasoline into it, okay? And you come back in a week. How is that gasoline going to be different versus the water that you had in there, aka which one's going to evaporate faster? Well, the gasoline will, right? Because it's more volatile, mm -hmm. okay? Now, and on the other end of things, let's say you have a beaker full of vegetable oil, and you come back after 17 years, right? <laughs> How much of it is still going to be there? Probably all of it still, right? It's, it has a vapor pressure, but it is so low that practically speaking, it's not going to evaporate. It's very non-volatile, right? So it specifically has, it's relating to the ability to evaporate? That's, that's the most common way to link them together, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's probably the easiest way to kind of think of those. If something is more volatile, is it more like gasoline compared to water? Is more gasoline more volatile? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. Cool. All right. I have a yeah. Is gasoline an alcohol? No. It's an alkane. Okay. So it's just a pure alkane? Yes. So we take this idea here about uh, dissolving things into solution, right? And then we go to the stuff that you guys have already been introduced to, right? So non-volatile solutes increase the boiling point. Why? Right, blah, blah, blah. We got all that stuff there. Don't need to read all this out to you. So here we go. The change in temperature for a boiling point, right, the delta Tb, right, is equal to some constant Kb there, right, times the lowercase m. Now, um, 
M, right? Whenever you see that lowercase italic M, don't forget that's molality, right? Whenever you guys are solving these problems, it's molality. One of the tricky parts or one of the maybe um, easy to forget parts is that since in this chapter we deal with molarity and molality, don't forget that when you guys are solving these boiling point elevation and freezing point depressions that we're dealing with molality exclusively for those, okay? So, right there. Now, um, so at the, at the beginning of this, this looks fairly simple, right? We have some kind of constant that you either are given information about, that K, or you have to calculate. At the end, what do we have here? A equation with what? Three parts to it, right? The change in temperature, right? That constant K and the molality. We learned how to calculate molality in this chapter, okay? A constant is either given, right? Usually it is, we'll have a couple problems here, right? And then the change in temperature is just something you calculate or something you'd have data about, right? Does that make sense? So again, we're just, it's one equation, three different parts to it, okay? Now you notice, because you guys have already seen this already, I'm missing a certain part of that, right? Mm -hmm. The, uh, what is it, the Van Hoff factor, is that what you guys called it, or the I, right? The same thing on the other end here, right? The freezing point lowering and boiling point elevation, right? So delta TF is equal to KF times uh, the molality. So just be careful, right? The, the KF is different than the KB. They're not the same constant, right? So that's different information that you guys have to be given. Don't, don't confuse those two there, right? So always pay attention to which unit, or excuse me, which constant you're putting into the property equation, okay? So, um, but other than that, these equations are, for all purposes, the same, right? Some change in temperature is affected by how much of your stuff you have dissolved, right? The molality, the concentration of it. Yep. Um, so does delta T just stand for change in temperature? Yep. Yeah. So is there anything more than just kind of like grammatical syntax involved in the delta T F versus the delta T B? Wouldn't they essentially be the same if they both just represent changes in temperature? Yes, but that's what I was just saying with K F versus K B. Right. Right? They're scaled by that constant, right? So they're, they're not going to be identical if that's what you're asking. Okay. Even for the same, right, if you, have the, if you have the same concentration in both of the equations there, the KF and the KB are different, so it's going to affect the temperatures mm -hmm. differently, right? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so, but there is something else there that uh, Rachel was kind of hitting on in, in, in the sense of what does it mean, right, for each of those values there, right? Uh, a freezing point depression boiling point elevation, right? So when we calculate a change in temperature, we have to pay attention to which specific thing we're calculating. Here's what I mean, right? So if we're depressing a freezing point, we calculate a delta T for that, right? A change in temperature for the freezing point. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. So let's say that I am doing an experiment in the lab and I add something to water and I measure its new freezing point. Okay, where does water normally freeze at? Zero, zero. zero degrees Celsius, right? And now I measure my new solution there and its freezing point is now negative 10. What's my delta T? Ten. 10. You guys get the, 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 the issue here? The change is just an absolute value, right? Right, it's just a change of 10. So when we're calculating freezing point depressions, don't forget your delta T value, subtract from the original freezing point. And the delta TF you add to your boiling point. You guys with me on this one? So pay attention to your signs is what I'm saying. Think about what you're calculating, all right? Everybody with me on this one? One of these common mistakes is that you guys calculate delta T and you're like, okay, that's my new boiling point, the freezing point. No, 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 don't forget you have to look at the original freezing point or boiling point of the solution, excuse me, the solvent that you're looking at. Good? All right. I have a weird question, Doc. I know you do. <laughs> I, again, no doubts. <laughs> are there are there any liquids that like like common liquids that have a freezing point below, um, or sorry, a boiling point below zero degrees Celsius, but not so far below that like 
he never could possibly see it. Ask your question again, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I'm not pricey. Wow. Are there, <laughs> are, there um, are there any substances that are like commonly work with in the lab that have a boiling point below zero degrees Celsius? Sure. Like in their work with, like in their liquid form? Uh, yes. In fact, industrially, ammonia is used quite a bit, and it's got a boiling point below zero degrees. Okay. In fact, that, that's always one of my favorite stories to tell, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell it to you when you're done. Wait, I thought ammonia is a, is a liquid. No, not, not at room temperature. I just got a boiling point of like negative 10 or something like that. Then how do you buy these bottles of ammonia at the store? You're not buying ammonia, you're buying ammonium hydroxide, a solution of ammonia. You bubble it through water, and that's what you buy. They still label it as ammonia. Yes, they do. That's true. It's deceptive. It's deceptive marketing. No, it's equilibrium. We'll talk about why that is later. <laughs> all right. So calculate the freezing point. Blah 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 blah. blah. I think you guys have all read at this point, right? Uh, where to start? Right? So we're talking about the, the calculate the freezing point, right? So we know we have to deal with that equation that we just introduced, right? This. So we need to figure that out. We're given KD, right? Or excuse me, the, the slope sign for the bottom. What's the variance? Yeah, KF. Right? So you need to figure this out. Because we have that information, so I'm saying calculate this, and then you can figure that out. Got it? Vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. That's the definition of boiling. That's not air that's bubbling to the surface. That's mostly vapor. Right? The, what, like if you're boiling water, right? That's mostly water vapor that's kind of boiling out of there. Yeah, there is some gases that are dissolved that boil out, but if not, not to the extent that you might be picturing. <laughs> Aha, uh -huh. so that's because of surface tension. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, so that's, that has to deal with something called nucleation. Codes, right, so you can actually do this at home pretty easily if you get like a glass container you put in the microwave. And if, if you don't touch it, you can super, you can basically heat that above the boiling point. And it, you can think of it kind of like it's trapped underneath the surface tension. Sure. And as soon as you disturb that surface tension, it'll out at once. That's what it is. That's why we always put stir bars or boiling chips or any of that kind of stuff in solution. Yeah, that's the definition of it. Right? But I'm not saying, but again, we, we don't live in a perfect world, right? There's other factors going on also, right? The atmosphere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, right? But so again, so whenever I give you, right, th this is a very common feeling, I guess, in Gen Chem, right? So whenever I give you a question like this, start to think about what information you do have, right? So I give you KF, or, or first of all, let's back up. I'm going to ask you to calculate the freezing point, right? So whenever there's a question like that, you know you have to use that, um, the equation that I just gave you there, right? The delta TF is equal to KF times the, uh, the molality, right? So I give you information about KF. Right? So what you have to do next is calculate the molality. If you have the KF and you have the molality, you can calculate the change in temperature, right? Does that make sense? So now what you have to use is the 30% ethylene there to calculate the molality. If you take a look on, I think it was Wednesday, we did a very similar example to this, right? So you have to take that percent into molality is what it is. So again, I, so I'll ask the question, what does 30% mean? What if you have a million grams of this solution? 30% of it isn't, right? What if you have a thousand grams of it? What if you have one milligram? Right? No, 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 I mean, it's just a 30%, right? I mean, you're, you could calculate molarity from this also, right? 
but we don't need molarity, we need molality. Yeah. So you're calculating a concentration again. Okay. So how do you calculate molality? You need what? Moles and kilograms of the salt. Got it? Let me give you guys a bit of information here now that you guys have kind of hammered this through real quick. Right, so um, ethylene glycol here has a molecular weight of uh, 62. I can't read my own handwriting this morning, that's good. Grams per mole, in case you guys might need that, intent you will need that. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> it's a very common thing that we talk about in this chapter for sure. So that's that's in later functions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. But then remember what that means: if thirty percent of whatever you pick is a hundred, you have to test for that other percent. Right. So I know what you're doing, but just you can do it that way, but it makes the math a little bit trickier just to kind of figure out what the 70% is, right? Yeah. So, can I trigger that? Okay, so then, like 30% of the solution, so what's the other 70? Water, which is your solvent, right? So that's important to recognize there, but make sure, because remember, when you talk about the latter, it's killing the plus salt. Not solution, right? It's like a common thing. So be careful, right? And then we're going to right? Total. Everyone's going to be saying total. Look, you guys forgot walking over, but it looks like you're involved. Jury, this is the final. Yeah, right. Looks like a mess. What is the best here? Oh, 
So here, here's the slide. Right? So we have uh, 30, or you didn't write that right, but 30% of the mixture. That's probably the same thing. Can you use 70 grams and not 100 grams? Right? No, so I'm assuming so 70 grams for the solution. Grams so there's 70 grams of H2O. The other 70, 70 grams is going to be water. Yeah. And then the so remember, it's per yeah. kilogram it's 30 of grams solvent. Water is your solvent. Right. Yeah. All right. So we have delta T, the freezing point is equal to the Kf times the molality, right? So we have three parts of our equation. It asks us to calculate the freezing point, so we have to calculate this. I give you information about Kf, so your job is to calculate the molality. Right? So this is very similar to an example we did earlier. If we have 30% of something, you can pick whatever number you want. But to make life easy, we'll say that 30 grams is our glycol, right? Which means what? 70, 70 grams is our water, which is our solvent. You guys with me on this? So it's important to recognize what your solvent is, especially when you're dealing with molality. How do we recognize what the solvent is? Well, the solvent's always there in the highest amount, right? That's the, the scientific definition of a solvent is, right? The thing that's there in the highest amount, okay? You guys with me? Cool. So now let's do some other math. So we need moles of glycol. So we do everyone's favorite conversion, grams to moles, right? And I got uh, about what, 0 0.483? Good. Now we need not grams of solvent, but kilograms. Good. So now we've got moles of what's dissolved and kilograms of solvent. Did I make mistakes? I think I, I think I'm okay. All right. So now we set it up. Wait, no, it's it's zero point zero zero seven, right? No, it's just zero point zero seven. Because it's seventy seventy. One, two, three. If I moved to three, it would get to seven. Oh, right. Yeah. It's okay. So now I put everything together. 1.86 degrees Celsius. Oops. Degrees Celsius, kilogram per mole, times my um, moles here. Uh, 0.483, right? Moles. So I got an answer of uh, what here? Wait a minute. Oh, I, I'm stupid. I'm sorry. Hang on. I just I was like, that's not right. Sorry, guys. 0 0.483 moles per 0 0.07 kilo. There we go. Now we're all good to go. Okay. <laughs> I was like, that's not going to come to the right answer. All right. Good. And if I do all that, then I got an answer of 12.8 uh, degrees Celsius, right? So, whew, we had a couple of challenges along the way, but we found our new freezing point. Our new freezing point's 12.8, right? No, it's negative 12. Point 8. Don't forget to always ask yourself the question at the end, what have I calculated and how do we use it? I calculated what? The change in the freezing point. Not the new freezing point, the change in the freezing point. Don't forget that part. I'm telling you guys, hang on a second. Yeah. Right? On the exam, you're gonna see a question like this. Don't, I, I, I do it too, I know, right? I'm like, yes, I finally got something right. <laughs> and I'm so happy, right? And if it's a multiple choice, you see your answer there, and you feel great, oh, oh right? <laughs> right? So don't forget to ask yourself at the end, right, what did I calculate? I calculated the change in, right? So we have to ask ourselves, what was the original freezing point? Good? So what's the original freezing point of water? Well, you guys know, right? It's up zero degrees Celsius. 
So what is our new freezing point? Essentially, we would say our original freezing point of zero minus what we calculated, right? So our answer is negative 12.8. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what would you do if instead it gave you a concentration of the solution instead of a percentage? You'd have to back out moles, right? I'd have to give you information on volume or something like that too, right? You're, I cry no first, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> What's up? So, um, can we just assume that usually, like, starting one would be zero, and if you don't get that, it's at seven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I tell you this is an aqueous solution, huh? right? Sorry, that kind of got uh, scrolled up there. I tell you this is an aqueous solution, so I'm telling you, hey, this is water. I expect you guys to know that, right? And I think a question that I have, if we'll get to today, right, I give you something that's not an aqueous solution, right, and then you guys have to just use the, the freezing point that I yeah. tell you guys. Exactly, yeah, yeah. There's, like I said, there's only so many ways I can ask this question where you're only missing one thing that you have to calculate. I have to give you all the rest of it, right? But good question, man. I don't expect you guys to know the freezing point of like cyclohexane right now. <laughs> All right. I don't know. I don't remember. I look it up if I need it. You could be right. All right. So anyway, um, here's a little bit of just definitions and all this kind of stuff. Um, again, I'm not you know a huge fan of reading uh, walls of text at you, but this is something important here to, to kind of realize, right? There is a difference depending on what you dissolve in your solution, okay? And this is, you know, gonna lead us into that discussion about the Van Hoff factor there and, you know, calculating I and the impact that that has. What's okay. the Van Hoff factor? That I value, that's part of the equation that I'll show you guys here, right? Well, we didn't do that in class. You didn't? No. Oh, I get to teach you guys new stuff, all right? <laughs> so we'll show you, okay. So sorry, God, thank you for telling me. I thought you guys had talked about that. I was about to just blast through this here. No, we were just dealing with AF. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So let me let me slow down a little bit here then. So if we went and we did an experiment then about uh, uh, the freezing point depression of sugar and urea, in essence we would see they have the same effect on the freezing point depression for that solution. Now the question then would be, well, is it then is the freezing point depression uh, separated from what you have dissolved, right? Because sugar and urea really don't have a lot in common, right? They're very different, right? Sugar has a lot of hydrogens and oxygens and carbons. Urea is a pretty darn small molecule. But we see that they have the same influence on the freezing point depression then, okay? Hmm? The formula for it? Uh, CO, uh, N2H4. Yeah. Um, but anyway, right? But if we, as soon as we switch to something like sodium chloride, we start to see something different happen, okay? And it, it comes down to this, these last two statements right here. Question, what is sodium chloride in terms of our broad classification of chemicals? Yeah? It's an ionic compound. It's an ionic compound, right? Now, what is an ionic compound? How do we identify them? How do we see them? How do we locate them? What do we know about them? That kind of thing. How do we know when something's ionic? What do we see? Yeah. A metal and a non-metal, right? A cation and an anion. Now, what do we know about ionic compounds when you put them in the solution? So what's, what was the term for? <laughs> They dissociate, got it? Unless they're nitrates, right? Now, nitrates typically always do, right? So they oh, wait, no, sorry, I was yeah. Right, so as soon as you put an ionic compound into solution, they dissociate into its component anions and cations. So if you want to think about it, if you dissolve one sodium chloride, you're really dissolving two things, a sodium cation and a chloride anion. And each of those components has an influence then, okay? And so if I dissolve something like, uh, just for argument's sake, iron three nitrate, right? So we have another ionic compound, one iron, 
three nitrates, I'd be dissolving four things into solution. So is that okay. our I? Mm -hmm. Is that our I that mm -hmm. is equal? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we have to start to pay attention to is what we're making a solution of. If you don't dissociate, right, if you're a covalent compound like ethylene glycol or sucrose or urea or any of these things we've talked about, you're just putting one thing into solution, okay? And so our I factor is then just gonna be one. But as soon as we put something that dissociates, we're gonna to have to account for how many different parts we dissolve into that. Okay, so you guys are gonna to have to basically count your ions is what it is. You guys with me on that one? So that's what we're talking about here, right? So how does that affect us? Well, instead of just the molality here, we have to put this I value in front of it there, okay? And so that's the Van Hoff factor that I was talking about here. It sounds really fancy and it sounds easier than just saying, or it sounds uh, more intelligent than just saying I, right? So <laughs> that's what it comes down to. Question in the back there? Okay, all right. So it's I times the molality, and then we multiply our constant in there also, right? So I'll give you guys the updated formula here in just a second. Um, look at uh, the third example down there, calcium chloride. So notice that we don't, be careful, I'll, I'll correct myself in just a couple slides here, but for our purposes, we don't care about the charge of the ions, right? Calcium has a two plus charge, we did talk about how two plus charges do have a different influence on water, right? In the spheres of hydration and how well it can attract things around it, okay? And so we'll see that I'm giving you guys a bucket of lies, right? But it's a good bucket, okay? It's a useful bucket, it's a good approximation, okay? But we do know that if I have a two plus charge versus a three plus, it is gonna influence water differently. And so sometimes things aren't always as straightforward as they make it seem here, right? So really this is an approximation when we add our I value in there. So for our purposes, we're just counting the different parts of whatever we dissolve, all right? Cool, so here we go again. So now I'll make it a little bit easier for you guys, right? I said what temperature will a 0.1 molar aqueous solution of urea versus a 0.1 aqueous solution of sodium chloride and sucrose boil, right? So we have three different things, all at the same molality, I'm asking us to calculate the delta or the, the, the temperature for where they boil, right? The temperature where they boil. So things to recognize. Urea is a covalent compound. Sucrose is a covalent compound. Okay? So if you're a covalent compound, you're not going to dissolve. Oh, excuse me. No, I, I, I do mean you're not going to dissociate is what I meant. So I is equal to one, okay? But for something like sodium chloride, I is gonna be equal to two, got it? So do a little plug and chug here, see what you guys come up with. About it, you only have to do this problem, you only have to answer two questions, right? Nobody knows. 
words that you don't know how to spell. Right? <laughs> hmm? it's a, so it's I times this times that. So you just add an I value into that total. It's basically, you can think of it as scaling the influence on the temperature, right? The more things you dissolve, the more it changes it. Yeah, for all we have, so we have three separate solutions all at the same volume. So don't forget that the, you know, I'm saying it's the temperature boil, right? Right. So the same thing that we talked about previously, make sure to add that to the known boiling thing. So, yeah, right? So remember, it's when you're talking about the freezing point, you lower a freezing point. When you're talking about a boiling point, you raise the boiling point. Right? So right idea, but just change that to a plus instead, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just gave you guys more space, right? But the way the way I'm gonna approach the way I'm gonna talk to you guys about is, you know, I give you guys three problems, you know, space to solve it all, but your VA and sucrose are the exact same thing. Right? So it's just more space if you need to do this. Maybe. You think you did it? You want me to make it harder for you guys, what you're saying? No, usually it's too hard. That's what I heard. Yeah. Usually it's too easy. <laughs> you guys get suspicious when you know an answer. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> change in the boiling point is equal to our stuff dissolved in there, right, the I, times the KB, which is a constant, times the molality. What part of that equation does it matter whether we have urea or sucrose or sodium chloride? The only part that's going to change is what? The I. You guys get what I'm saying? If everything is the same in all of these except for the I, right? then the delta T for urea and sucrose are going to be the same. You guys catch what I'm saying with this? And then how do we, if I know the delta T for urea and sucrose, how would I get it for sodium chloride? Let's multiply by two instead. You guys see what I'm saying with this? So it's, it's in, in that right there you say, oh, that, that's nice and that's easy, right? But it should also say, hey, wait a minute. I don't think this is how it works in real life. And you're absolutely correct. Because this goes back to something else I said there, right? That for our purposes, this is a good approximation. In reality, urea is very different than sucrose and sodium chloride. So reality is going to be a little bit different than what we calculate here. Because this is completely agnostic, so to speak, of what the, the, the actual identity of what we are dissolving in there, right? They're unitless with respect to that, so to speak, right? We're just saying, oh, it's whatever we dissolve in, it changes the temperature. So just to put some pen to paper here, uh, delta T, boiling point, right? Um, one, right, times 0 0.51 degrees Celsius, kilogram, mole, and we have a molality of 0 0.1 uh, moles, right, per kilogram, there, right, per molality. Okay, which one am I calculating here? Uh, urea or sucrose, right? Whichever one you want. So if I do this, I got 0 0.051 degrees C, right? 
So my new boiling point is 0 0.051, right? Don't do that, right? Remember, we're dealing with aqueous solution, so what's my boiling point? The question is asking, what temperature will this boil at? So my answer is going to be 100, right? 0 0.051 degrees Celsius is my new boiling point. Good? That's a huge difference. It is. Yes? So why are you at 100? We're looking at the boiling point of an aqueous solution. So what's the boiling point of water? 100 degrees Celsius, right? This is our change in boiling point. So 100 plus our change in boiling point, right? Good question. Got it? So to save myself many, many, many calories, right? We'll calculate it for sodium chloride there. Wow, all right. Right? So essentially, we now we get 0 0.1, okay? So what would the boiling point be for sodium chloride then? That would be what, 100.1. Got it? You guys like those problems? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Can I be on the quiz? Yeah, no, no, it'll probably be on the quiz during the end. Right? Look, right? I can't fail everyone right away. I have to wait until after the problem. Okay, where it really kind of, you know, sticks it to you guys. <laughs> when is that, when is that, in March or something like that? Is that, then you guys are stuck with me, is that what it is? <laughs> no, no, the, the withdrawal date, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, I, still, I still have to be nice to you guys for a couple of weeks, so. All right, oh wait, then there's evaluations, crap. <laughs> Plan, ruined. <laughs> all right, so, just as a quick kind of put all these ideas together there, and, um, some of the problems in the back of the book, they you know use these different solvents and things like that, right? So just just some information there for you guys to, uh, for whatever you're whatever you might be looking at. Okay? And there is our maybe expanded, right? Maybe our expanded uh, uh, um, uh, equations for what we've been calculating all along, right? So don't forget to put your pure solution, you know, and your solvent and all that kind of stuff together to get your final answer. And here is the vicious, vicious lie. There's a couple other things going on, right? And um, you'll notice that at the top is what we have to pay attention to also, right? At a low concentration, this is gonna be true. As soon as we get to higher concentrations, uh, not true, okay? So, and, why, and why? Great question. Why don't you come to my office hours and you can just, <laughs> right? It's a good question. It might be something that you guys should think of because you guys actually can come up with an answer for that, right? based off of what we've been discussing in class and all these other kind of things. Yeah? Is it because when you, as you raise the molarity, you can reach a point? Come see me in my office. <laughs> all right. And so the last, or the last idea here that they kind of talk about with colligative properties is this idea of osmosis and osmotic pressure. Um, we used to do an experiment where we, uh, and in fact, our uh, Chem 105 course does this experiment where we look at uh, osmotic pressure and stuff. You guys probably do something like that in biology, though, right? Osmosis is a little bit more on the, the, the dreaded B word, biology. <laughs> right? But maybe you guys have seen that uh, where you can like, <clears throat> excuse me, make a, we have like these permeable bags of a starch solution and you can measure how long it takes for iodine to, you know, to go into the bag and change the starch to a nice pretty blue color and we can, you know, measure the osmotic pressure and all these other kind of things out. Hold on, what you're saying, if I put iodine in starch, it'll turn blue. Mm -hmm. A very beautiful blue color, yep. So, like, a bottle of, like, medical iodine and cornstarch would turn blue. In a solution of it, yeah. Oh, I gotta test that. Well, we'll, we'll yeah, sort of, that's what I'll say with that. There's a slight correction that I'll make with it, but the idea there is the same. Okay, so there's the definition, blah, 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 you guys got it. All right. So here's what you guys really wanted, more equations. Okay, so osmotic pressure, <clears throat> the pressure that must be applied to stop osmosis, AKA, right, you know, just make, make something, you know, pass through the membrane or not. So that's this symbol right here, like M is the molarity now, okay? Molarity times a gas constant, times the absolute temperature, times that Van Hoff factor again, okay? So now I've really made it tricky for you guys and I've given you five variables, right? But as always, I need to give you information about four of those is what it is, okay? But the K 
calculate the pressure, the little leaning table symbol there at that one side, right? is equal to capital M, the molarity, which you guys should know how to calculate, a gas constant, okay? So another constant. Absolute temperature means what? Temperature in units of um, Kelvin, right? So you can always remember that whenever we're dealing with gas constants, pretty much always we're gonna be using Kelvin, right? Um, and then our Van Hoff factor there, okay? Good? Cool. And so I think there's like one, one or two examples in the, in, the, in the chapter that work through this. Yeah? So would this affect like salt water absorption? Absolutely. So, okay, so there's that. That's the end of this chapter. On Monday, we'll do a couple of practice problems and kind of work through uh, a couple of these uh, in, in chapter problems here, and then we'll move on to kinetics, okay? Move on to kinetics. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, but I forgot it, so that was trying to avoid saying <laughs> You caught me. I'm sorry. I literally, I forgot. I, I literally can't remember what it is, but it's like the Greek. It's like the capital pi symbol in Greek. I forget what it's called. So, yes, there's a term. Sorry. <laughs> so, we can call it the leaning table for now. <laughs> Thank you.